All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Chris Barton. I am a children's book author. I live in Austin, so right here in the middle of the state. Um, some of you, I, I may have been to your schools before. I've been to lots of schools, especially around the Austin area in San Antonio and Houston and the Dallas Fort Worth area. Um, and so Ordinarily, at this time of the year, I'd be out talking to students at schools, but as we know, this is not an ordinary time of the year. Um, so I'm at home, and, but I still want to share some of my books and share some of my work with you all. So um, I just want to talk with you a little bit about the books that I've made. Uh, let me call up a little presentation for you guys. So that's me, and that's where you can find more information about me uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about my books or in connecting with me online. And so this is, um, th this is the collection of books that I've written. So I have been pursuing the writing books for children for, uh, I'm in my 20th year of doing that now, and it works out neatly that I now have 20 books and I write both fiction and nonfiction. They're more or less split down the middle of the 20 books I've done so far. Um, they've done a few more been fiction than nonfiction, but other books I've got coming up in the next uh, in the next couple of years, it's more nonfiction than fiction. Um, I love doing both fiction and nonfiction. I would not have nearly as much fun uh, writing books if I felt like I had to choose between one or the other. So I'll be talking about both types of my, of my books today. Now, long before I was a writer of children's books, I was a reader of children's books and a, just an all around garden variety, ordinary kid growing up in Texas. I grew up in a town up in the northeast corner of the state called Sulphur Springs. Um, and this is me when I was in first grade. And some of the things that I loved when I was in elementary school, I loved the Houston Oilers football team, including number 34, Earl Campbell. I love the Muppets, everything about the Muppets, the Muppet movies, the Muppet music, the Muppet TV shows. I loved reading nonfiction books about old monster movies. And I'm talking about movies that were made in black and white decades before I was even born. I loved reading about how they made the movies, how the makeup artists would transform the actors into monsters like Frankenstein and Dracula. I loved watching Star Wars movies and playing with Star Wars action figures. And when I was growing up, when I was in first grade, there was only one Star Wars movie. Um, and we had to wait three years before we could go back to the theater to see the next Star Wars movie, then three more years before the one after that. And so what I would do, and what my friends and I would do in the meantime is, we spent a lot of time playing with Star Wars action figures. And that was some of my first storytelling because we would use the action figures to retell our favorite parts of the first Star Wars movie. We would make up new stories about those Star Wars characters using the action figures. So for me, loving Star Wars was a lot about loving storytelling and a lot about loving learning how to tell a story. Another couple of things I was crazy about when I was in elementary school, I loved collecting postage stamps and I loved the music of the country singing group called the Oak Ridge Boys. Um, now, some of you may have heard a saying called, write what you know. And write what you know just means if you need to tell a story and you're not sure what to make that story about, you can make that story about something that you already know a lot about. And you can do this for fiction or for nonfiction. So if you're gonna write fiction and you're gonna write what you know, and what you know is, let me just grab something nearby, something that's at hand, and what you know is turtles. Here's a turtle. Um, if your favorite thing is turtles, if you know a lot about turtles, if you have a pet turtle, you might write a story about one day you wake up and your pet turtle is as big as a house. What do you do when your pet turtle is suddenly way bigger than a turtle is supposed to be, as big as your house? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Do you try to figure out why your turtle got to be so big? Do you tell all the world about your turtle or do you somehow try to keep it a secret from everybody? I don't know what the answers are to those questions, but those are examples of the types of questions you might ask uh, when you're writing fiction, writing what you know, when what you know is turtles. You take everything you know about turtles and you use your imagination to fill in the rest. But you can do the same thing for nonfiction. So if you're going to write nonfiction and you're going to write what you know and what you know is turtles, you might write a biography of a herpetologist. A herpetologist is a scientist who studies reptiles and amphibians. Uh, what is this herpetologist's name? Where were they born? When were they born? At what age did they develop an interest in, in herpetology and reptiles and amphibians? 
Where did they go to college to study that? And what does a herpetologist do all day? Those are examples of the types of questions you might ask if you're writing nonfiction, writing what you know when what you know is herpetology, what you know when what you know is turtles. Um, but now that I've told you all this about writing what you know, I've got to confess something to you. That's not actually what I do when I write my books. I don't write what I already know. I write about things I don't know yet, but that I want to learn. I don't start off any of my books as an expert in what I'm writing about. I start off each of my books with a lot of questions and a lot of curiosity. And writing a book is my way of answering those questions and satisfying that curiosity. And this goes for my fiction and for my nonfiction because I write both types of books. When I'm writing fiction, there's always some basic question at the heart of that story. And some of the questions I've had in my fiction books have included, how will this kid pick one musical instrument to learn to play if they have 88 different instruments to choose from? And what if an ordinary pickup truck became a superhero? And who will win a series of crazy competitions between a shark and a train? Or if it's a fire truck and a dragon, will anyone win? Now, Fire Truck versus Dragon is my newest Book. It came out earlier this month, and what I'd like to do now is read you the beginning, at least, of Fire Truck vs. Dragon, which I wrote. I write the words to all my books. I do not create the illustrations. So the illustrations for this book, they were created by an artist from Georgia named Shandon McCloskey. So this is our book, Fire Truck vs. Dragon. This book is upside down. That's not how you read it. Someone fix that. So here we go. Fire Truck vs. Dragon, written by me, illustrated by Shandon McCloskey. Clearly, we're about to see some fire and some water. We're gonna see a big old blast of fire coming for the dragon because that's what dragons do. And we're gonna see a big old blast of water coming from fire trucks because, well, what else is a fire truck gonna do? So here we go. Are you ready for that big blast of fire and water? I know I am. That is not a big blast of fire and water. There's no fire and water at all. They are just, they're making weird faces at each other. That's not the showdown we we're expecting. Let's see what's gonna happen on the next page. Well, this is even worse. Not only are they not blasting at each other, they're just goofing off and cutting up. Fire truck is saying, ha, 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 and dragon is saying, he, he, he. And these kids are like, what is going on here? And dragon says, it might surprise you that a fire truck and a dragon can in fact be good friends. Fire truck says, we get along great. Why wouldn't we? Dragon says, I know, right? I mean, what are dragons really good at? It's sort of obvious. It's completely obvious. And what are fire trucks really, really, really good at? Put the two of us together and you can guess why everyone loves having us at campfires. And I know some things that get lit on fire when you're at a campfire and when something gets lit on fire, you're gonna put it out with something, right? Well, let's see. That's why everyone loves having us at campfires. And Dragon is just making like a shadow puppet bunny on the side of the tent. And Fire Truck says then, under the midnight moon, a fearsome forest creature appeared. And that is not what these kids down here were expecting. Dragon says, I get the feeling they might be thinking of something else we're good at. Ah, gotcha. And that's why everyone loves having us at barbecues and cookouts. And I don't know about you, but whenever I go to a barbecue or a cookout, there's gonna be something lit on fire, which means something's gonna need to get put out later. So let's see. That's why everyone loves having us at barbecues and cookouts. I prepared some free range potato salad. Hey, hey, it's my famous firehouse beans. Potato salad? Beans? That is not what I was expecting from Fire Truck and Dragon. Dragon says, I wonder if they were actually thinking of the other, other things we're really good at. Absolutely. And that's why we always get invited to birthday parties. Now I'm feeling pretty good about where things go from here. So that's where we'll stop with Fire Truck versus Dragon. Now let's go back to the presentation. So those are some of my fiction books. But like I said, I also write nonfiction. And whenever I'm writing nonfiction, there's, there's things I'm trying to figure out there too. 
I think when I'm writing nonfiction, I'm just trying to get a better understanding of how some part of our world got to be the way that it is. And I do that through research. And research, it really just comes down to asking lots of questions. It can take lots of different forms. There's library research, there's internet research. Now's a great time to do internet research, not so much for library research. There are books you can get, there are people you can talk to, there are places generally that you can go to, uh, maybe see for yourself some place where some historical event happened. But however we, we do our research, it all comes down to asking questions. And some of the questions I've had for my nonfiction books have included, how did a rocket scientist by the name of Lonnie Johnson become the inventor of the super soaker water gun? One of the greatest toys of all time, because that is not the path most rocket scientists go down. Now for this book, I was able to speak directly with Lonnie Johnson himself. He's still very much alive. He's still very busy as an inventor but he made time for me to interview him on the telephone on four occasions so I could research and write whoosh, Lonnie Johnson's super soaking stream of inventions, which as some of you may know, was illustrated by a fellow Texan of ours. His name is Don Tate. He lives right here in Austin. We've been friends for longer than we've been making books together. And this is a book that we made together, whoosh. I also wanted to know for this book, why anyone would think it was a good idea at a time of war, if you're trying to keep a ship getting sunk why would you paint it to look like this i knew that it happened but that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me i didn't know how that was supposed to work or whose idea it was or what made somebody so desperate they would suggest something so strange but the more i read about these dazzle ships used during world war one the more i wanted to tell that story this is my newest nonfiction book. It's called All of a Sudden and Forever, Help and Healing After the Oklahoma City Bombing, which is a true event. It's an actual event that happened in this country uh, 25 years ago this spring. And this book is not so much about the bombing itself, but about how a community um, recovers from and memorializes some, some tragic event that happens, some terrible thing that happens, how people come together and help each other move forward. That's what I wanted to understand better by, by researching and writing this book. And for this book, the question is right there at the title. What do you do with a voice like that? I wanted to know how a person who's born with a natural gift of a powerful speaking voice, how they're able to grow and develop that gift, that voice into a tool they can use to make life better for lots of other people. Now, I'm excited about this book for several reasons. For one, out of all of my books, this is the first time I've ever written an entire book about a fellow real life Texan. Her name was Barbara Jordan. And so that's one reason why I'm excited about this book. Another reason why I'm excited, this book has been named to the Texas Blue Bonnet Award Master List for next year. So that means if you're in third grade or fourth or fifth or sixth, and you participate in the Blue Bonnet program, this is one of the books that you'll be able to, to read and you'll be able to vote on next January. So I would like to read you a few pages of what do you do with the voice like that. The story of extraordinary Congresswoman Barbara Jordan, written by me and illustrated by Aqua Holmes. She's an artist from Boston, Massachusetts. Again, this is a true story. Growing up in the Fifth Ward of Houston, Texas, Barbara Jordan stood out. She may have looked like other kids. She may have acted like other kids but she sure didn't sound like other kids, not with that voice of hers. That voice, that big, bold, booming, crisp, clear, confident voice, it caused folks to sit right up, stand up straight, and take notice. What do you do with a voice like that? Well, first you give that voice something to say. Barbara recited poetry at church. She memorized speeches for school. She entered oratory contests and in 1952 won a trip to Chicago, the first time she'd ever left Texas. Barbara was proud of herself and proud of her voice. It was laying a path for her. But where would that path lead? On Sunday evenings, Barbara would talk things over with Grandpa Patton. Would she become a preacher like her father and like her mother could have been? Or a teacher 
like those who encouraged her at Phyllis Wheatley High. Or perhaps she'd become a lawyer. Not many black women had achieved that. But one who had done so visited Wheatley and gave a stirring speech. Barbara was inspired. Being a lawyer would be a marvelous use of her voice. But before that can happen, what's the next thing you do with a voice like that? You give it more knowledge to work with. College opened Barbara's eyes to how the country was changing and how it wasn't. She learned how to find facts for herself, debate important issues, defend good ideas, and dismantle bad ones. Her law classes challenged her more than anything she'd known. She hid her struggles from her classmates, studying long and hard and out of sight. And when she graduated, yes, Barbara became a lawyer, but being a lawyer bored her. She used a typewriter and pen a lot more than she did her voice, and there was not enough work to occupy her time or her mind. There was, however, lots of political work that needed doing. In 1960, America was not as free or as fair a place as it could be. Barbara believed that politics could change that, so she got involved. One night, a scheduled speaker was absent and Barbara was asked if she would fill in. She said yes. The audience loved her. They trusted her. Most important, they were inspired to do something, to get out and vote and to help round up others and get them to vote. Her voice had made a difference. Barbara, bitten by the political bug, as she later put it, knew just what to do with a voice like that. And that's what the rest of the book is about is what Barbara Jordan did with that fantastic voice of hers. Now, when I visit schools, um, I will, after I've read what do you do with a voice like that, I will talk about Barbara Jordan's natural gift. And everybody who's heard me read what do you do with a voice like that knows that the natural gift that Barbara Jordan was born with was the gift of a powerful voice. But when Barbara Jordan was in, say, elementary school, even though she had a distinctive voice at that age, um, she did not already know exactly what it was that she wanted to do with that voice. She didn't know what to do with it at that young age. There are things that she did throughout her life, putting her voice to public use, practicing, um, getting more education. Those are things that Barbara Jordan did to grow her natural gift of her powerful speaking voice. Now, I also have a natural gift, and hopefully by this point, people who have read my books or heard me talk about writing have some idea that maybe I've got a natural gift for writing. I think I do have a natural gift for writing. I certainly enjoyed writing even when I was as young as in elementary school. But when I was in elementary school, I did not already know exactly what to do with my natural gift for writing. There are things that I've done throughout my life, things I still do today to grow my gift for writing. One of them we talked about earlier, and that's research. I could not write any of my nonfiction books using only the information that's already in my head. I do lots of research for every nonfiction book that I write. Um, and also, I revise. I rewrite and I rewrite and I rewrite my stories again. Every book that I've written, I bet every book that's on a bookshelf in your home or in your school or in your library is a result of an author or of an author and an illustrator revising their work again and again and again. None of us get it right the first time. And also, I collaborate. I've never made any book all by myself. I collaborate with illustrators, but we also collaborate with editors and art directors and with a whole team of people who are involved in making any single book. So through research and revision and collaboration, I've been able to grow my gift as a writer. Now, you also have natural gifts. I don't know what your gifts are because you know, we've only just met and haven't got to know each other all that well, but you've got these natural gifts. Everybody has a natural gift. And so what I want you to think about, whatever your natural gift is, um, what's one thing that you can do to grow that natural gift? Is it practicing? Is it pushing yourself into new areas where you're not entirely confident you, you can succeed if you like art? Maybe you'll push yourself into making art using different materials, different media, um, different types of subjects, different styles. One way that I find that we can get better at things we're already pretty good at doing is teaching somebody how to know what we already know how to do. 
And so if you're really good at dribbling a basketball and you have a friend who's not, if you help them, if you talk with them, if you teach them um, how they can become better at dribbling, that's going to reinforce what you already know how to do. And that's going to make you better at doing that. We'll show you where you still have room to improve. Now, I want to know, you've heard about the questions I've had, uh, the, the basic questions at the heart of my fiction books and the questions I try to answer when I'm writing my nonfiction books. Um, at this point, my presentations where I usually ask the, the students who are in front of me, assuming I can see them right in front of me, what they want to know. And there are two questions I do often receive when I visit schools. And those two questions are, are you married and can I see a picture of your dog? Well, yes, I am, and yes, you can. Thank you so much for asking. I am married to another author. My wife, Jennifer Ziegler, also writes books. She writes very funny chapter books and novels for elementary school students and middle school students and high school students, including her series about the Brewster triplets, these uh, identical triplets who grew up in, in a small town in Texas, a real place called Johnson City, Texas. And this is the first Brewster triplets book. It's called Revenge of the Flower Girls. Jennifer and I, we have four children, three sons and one daughter. Daughter, and we have this dog, his name is Ernie. Now, since I don't have an actual audience right in front of me, except for that plush turtle that I dropped over there, so I can't even reach it to talk with. Um, there are a few questions I, uh, a few additional questions I get when I visit business schools. So I want to answer some of those basic questions. Um, often I get the question, um, where do you get your ideas from? And I've gotten ideas from my books from things that I've read, from things that I've watched, from things that I've seen as I've walked through my neighborhood or conversations I've overheard within my own home. Um, there, I feel like ideas are all over the place. And because ideas and inspiration is all over the place, it's not so important uh, where an idea comes from is what do you do when you get an idea? I try to always have a notepad and a pen with me. So when I have an idea, I can write it down. To me, there's no feeling more frustrating than remembering that I have an idea, but not being able to remember what that idea actually was. Um, another question I get is, um, what's my favorite book? So out of those 20 books that I've made, which book is my favorite? And that is the hardest question that you could possibly ask me. Why would you do such a thing to me? What's my favorite book? It's like asking me which one of my kids do I love the most? If you have siblings, you know the answer is, I love them all the most. Um, and seriously, every book that I've made, there's something about that book that makes that book special to me. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, a book called The Daniel Brothers was my first book. That book took me eight years. That was a book that transformed me from an aspiring writer into a published author. I'm so glad I did not give up on that book. Um, that book will always be special to me because of that transformative effect it had on my life. Shark vs. Train has been my best-selling book. That doesn't make it a better book because it was a bestseller. Uh, but it means that more people have gotten joy from that book than from any of my other books. Um, so that book will always be special to me for that reason. And I could name something about each one of my books, uh, you know, like, like I named for the Nagula Brothers and Sharp vs. Train, about why that book is special to me. But you know, I get up most days of the week. Well, before I would have said I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, honestly, now that we're all stuck at home, I'm sleeping in as late as 6 a.m. I know. Um, but if I'm getting up at 6 a.m. or especially if I'm getting, uh, getting up at 5 a.m. to start my work as an author, I'd better really love the work that I'm doing right then. So maybe anytime somebody asks me what my favorite book is, the right answer better be the book that I'm making right now, because that's the book that has to motivate me out of bed tomorrow morning um, to, you know, to, to get back to work as an author instead of hitting snooze for another hour or two. And one last question I'll often receive is, um, am I going to make any more books? Do I have any more books in the works? And the answer is yes, I've got several books in the works. Um, one book that I've got uh, that I've, I've been working on and I've, I've talked about publicly is a nonfiction book about glitter. Um, now, some people love glitter. 
Some people don't like litter at all. I'm writing a book for all of those people, whether they love litter or whether they don't love litter. Uh, it's a fascinating subject. I'm enjoying all that I've learned about it. Uh, going way, way back to you know, early on in human history and the thing, the sparkly things we found that, that people seem drawn to, but also the question of what are they going to do about the litter in the future? Because you know, litter is like little pieces of plastic and we don't necessarily need to make four little pieces of plastic that go into a big, uh, big swirling you know, place in the Pacific Ocean known as, uh, as the Eastern Garbage Patch. Um, so that's, again, that's a whole lot more about glitter than just glitter, yay, or glitter, boo. But that's one of the, that's one of the, of the books that I'm working on right now. So we've talked a lot this morning. We've talked about things that we know and things that we love and also things that we've learned as we go along. And one thing I've learned along the way through making books is how much I do love this part of being an author. And my hope for each one of you is that whatever you find yourself doing when you're grown, whether you're an author or an illustrator or a teacher or a librarian or a congressperson like Barbara Jordan, I hope when you're grown that you love doing that thing so much that you would want to find a great big audience like, like you and tell them all about what you do with your life. Thank you so much for spending time with me today to hear me talk about my work as an author. Um, go find yourself something fun to read or go find yourself something fun to write. Enjoy it. Take care of yourselves. Bye.